If I would give you two really good bang for your bucks for overall anti-aging, red light therapy, IPL, and then microneedling would technically be the third one. The three top tips to look 10 years younger. So if I were to tell you, you know, the number one thing to overall improve your skin, I would say reduce the amount of sugar you eat because that really is inflammatory to your body. It's inflammatory to your skin and it will show in your skin. Now, reduce the amount of sugar is going to make wrinkles go away. No, it's not going to make wrinkles go away. But once again, it's kind of that basis that you have to do because it's constantly attacking the collagen of your skin if you're having too much sugar. Mm. Now, if you're looking at, okay, I truly want to look 10 years younger. What should I do in like a short span of time? Then yes, I would combine IPL treatments for a lot of people, probably with Morpheus 8. And then if I had one other thing that I would combine that with, probably more for a long term, and I would say add a retinol or a bakuchiol to that just to kind of keep those results. So this is going to be, this is a fun podcast. I'm excited yes. to have you on Thank here because this is uh, really something that I've been, you know, you, what you do, I have, I have doctor, I should say who you are, uh, Dr. Anthony Yoon, I pronounced your name, right? Correct. Uh, you're a plastic surgeon mm -hmm. and one of the most popular doctors on TikTok by far. Mm -hmm. And you too, you've got a crazy, you you even have like a crazy like subscription yeah. like on <laughs> YouTube. You have like 5 million people yeah, I follow. Just hit, I like hit 5 million two days ago, I think. My employees saw it before I did. And I didn't know until they started messaging me. I'm like, what? I did hit 5 million? No, it's yeah, unbelievable. It's like yeah. your videos get so much traction. And right before we started taping, and I said, I don't want to do this off of uh, taping because I want everything I say to you to sound authentic. You know, even though you are a doctor and a board certified plastic surgeon, everything, you are an exceptional content creator. You're, Thank you. you. No, you're welcome. Thank you. You've done a very good job at like, you know how to title things, you know to give how to like give people the information in a way that's very user-friendly and it's like, it, it, it's it's shareable and it's everything, like all the things, like you can go down, you're the kind of person I hate when I'm trying to go to sleep at night and I get on your on your page <laughs> and I get down a crazy down rabbit, rabbit hole <laughs> yes, because one video turns into like 400 videos because they're oh, all you. so good. Thank you. I appreciate it. No, well, how, like, how are you like, how did you even know how to become like, how did you become a content creator? Do you, do you see yourself as that even? I do. So I mean, I've always had a bit of a creative streak. Um, and there's always been some type of outlet. So when I was in college, my creative streak was I was into art and I painted. I did a lot of oil painting. Okay. Um, and I did a lot of writing. And honestly, the, I took like creative writing and the people in college hated my writing because I'd write things that were funny. And back in college, you know, yeah. it's all, you know, it's all about trying to if, express your emotions and all these people who are having hard times. And here I try to put something to just make people laugh. And I like people hated it. Um, so after college, I went into residency and I did a, a medical school, then residency. I did a complete plastic surgery residency, Where general surgery. School? So I went to Michigan State for medical school. Okay. Um, and then I did three years of general surgery residency, two years of plastic surgery residency. And during my residency training t years, I was actually in a band, in a Jimmy Buffett cover band. <laughs> <laughs> and so we toured around kind of Michigan. We did some shows in Wisconsin and Illinois. And I mean, we were not very good, but we would just play like bar tunes and Jimmy Buffett music and stuff. Love it. Um, and then I start my practice and I start thinking my goal is to get busy. And while I was early in practice, my practice exploded because I was on a show called Dr. 90210. You were? on the In the first season, fourth episode, I was on it for literally like two minutes. And they had me come in and then they had my going away party and I was gone and that was it. But that two minutes literally powered my practice as I just started in, uh, in Detroit, Michigan for like two years where I had like literally the day before that show aired, I had no patience. I was living in a little apartment with my wife and our little dog trying to find any way to get anybody to come see me as a patient. And then the show airs, I'm on for two minutes and the next day my practice exploded. And so it taught me the power of media from there, I when blogs were really big, mm -hmm. I was one of the first surgeons, plastic surgeons to create a blog, and I made one actually about celebrity plastic surgery. That became like the top um, watched blog, really a red blog in plastic surgery for many years. I got sued by a paparazzi because of a photo of Cindy Lauper that I put on my blog that I didn't realize was copyrighted. I had a, a reverse class action lawsuit against me for this one photo for $150,000. I scrubbed my, my blog of all the pictures. My blog died after that. 
And then I uh, parlayed it into actually doing TV. Um, I saw some people from Rap Rachel Ray show saw me and I started getting on Rachel Ray show. I did Dr. Oz, the doctors. And then from there, I realized after doing that for many years and being kind of like the go-to plastic surgeon for TV, yeah. that they started giving these spots to younger, better looking doctors. And I like felt like one of those <laughs> actors that like has age past their prime. <laughs> and I'm seeing like all these spots going to these younger, better looking people. And I realized, okay, I need to transition again. And so I shifted over to social media. Uh, and that's what I've been really focused on since then. Are you, okay, what year was that, that you started with social media? So I started really transitioning to social media, probably it was like 2017, maybe 2016, back when it was like Facebook and Twitter. And I really focused on those. Right. And you know, a good friend of mine, Dr. Pimple Popper. Yeah, very uh, popular too. Yes. So she told me probably back in 2017, she's like, Tony, stop spending all this time on Facebook. You got to go on YouTube. And I'm like, no, no, I'm doing all these Facebook lives yeah. and all that stuff. And here you can see she's got her own show. It's like, Huge. I think, syndicate. Yeah, and uh, I, sh I should have gone to YouTube earlier. <laughs> well, meanwhile, you have 5 million people following you. And like the funny thing, she, she's massive. Yes. I mean, it's, and I cannot believe how many people want to watch people like popping pimples. Yeah. It is. People find it relaxing. How is that relaxing? I don't, I have no idea, but people love watching this type of stuff. You or know? is it like a bad accident? Like you can't help to look away. I think it's actually satisfying for people. It's like when, it's like when you, um, I mean, sometimes I'll see things that I find are satisfying. You know, I have, so for example, and this is something that's too, TMI, but I have this, I have what's called a dilated pore of Wiener on my back which essentially is a big hole in your back where you can get stuff that kind of builds up like sebum and oil and stuff like that. Yeah. And once every like four months, my wife or my daughter will pick the thing out and they just find it so satisfying <laughs> to clear it out. And I think that's what it is, is people somehow find that type, these pimple popping things satisfying because they see the before and they see the after. And see, I get it on yourself, better. right? Like, yeah, like if you have something like, and you get, you, you are able to pop it, but watching other people's pimples be, I, it's so disgusting i don't get it either but it's a big deal it's yeah, how many followers huge. does that girl have the pimple so popper. yeah dr lee i mean i think on on i think like 14 million was last i saw on like youtube and then on tiktok she's up at like 12 million or something and yeah it's it's i mean and she's got her national show that's in probably like the sixth season or something like that well that also helps a lot right like you were saying the yeah. power of media in general tv yeah. doesn't have as much as much weight or power as it used to social media is basically it's dropped a lot yeah it's dropped a lot but it's yeah. a great way it's a great engine to even get you started right and then the well, momentum of social media and what i realized you know and i know you have a lot of people listen to you for business advice and stuff what i really realized very quickly doing so much tv was that the platform was not mine it was the i was at the whim of the producer right. so i've i've this is my fourth book younger for life my first three books i really relied on producers to whether whether my book was going to be successful or not right. and it was whether they would allow me on their show of whether it would do well and I realized after I started losing these opportunities that right. I got to create my own platform. You know, I can't let other people dictate whether I'm going to be successful or not. And that's when I pivoted to social media and I put all my kind of creative juices into that. Yeah, you took you, 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 took, you basically took control of your own destiny. Yes. Funnily enough, we have a very similar story because, um, well, this podcast was supposed to be a TV show. Uh, mm -hmm. NBC actually, uh, we did, I did a deal with them, a development deal, and it was going nowhere fast. It was staying, it was basic. it wasn't called habits and hustles. It was called game changer. It was supposed to be this whole idea of being like the cribs, but for entrepreneurs, like remember the, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. and it was like a, at the time it was very, it was very irreverent. Yeah. And, you know, I, re I realized quite quickly that six months turned into a year, a year and a half, and a year and a half, and like literally nothing was happening. Yeah. And I'm like, this is unbelievable. I cannot be putting the my future and my destiny in the hands of other people to make the decision. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to do some like little podcast and kind of like do it on my own. Whatever happens, happens. And yeah. Is it not a T it's on a TV show, but you know what, then you have, it, then you at least take control and ownership yeah. of what is yours yeah. and the amount of opportunities and the people I've met and the fact that like, I'm now my own boss in that way has exponentially changed my life. And so I'm a big proponent of that. Like you cannot, if you're always going to be looking at someone else to kind yeah. of 
take, you know, basically control and, and curate what happens for your own life. You're going to be the CEO of your own life. And you've totally. obviously done a good job. Well, and then doing something like that, you know, having your own platform, there are other opportunities that will come Absolutely. and you may get even a better TV show. You know, there's this show right now on Netflix, the Squid Game, the reality uh, show. Of course. I'm like, have you been watching that? hundred percent. Even the so, I'm watching the reality show of the Squid Game. So back when the first Squid Game game came out, yeah. people thought I was the lead actor and people would go on my social media and ask me, <laughs> like are you on Squid Game? And I would answer, yes, I am. Yeah. And I say, yeah, I'm the lead actor. And they're like, really? They, How do you find so time to be a surgeon and an actor? I'm like, oh, I have plenty of time. I just do it. <laughs> and I tell you, Jennifer, my following grew like a million and a half followers on TikTok within like literally like two weeks or something. It was insane because people thought I was this guy. That's hilarious. I still have people stop me on the street and ask me. Most time people stop me. They know who I am because I, you know, I'm on social and everything. But every once in a while I get people like, wait a minute, do I know you? And I'm like, oh, maybe like you're on Squid Game. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> that is amazing. And you made it work to your advantage, obviously. Yes. And so this whole reality show now is out and they actually... Um, I actually uh, heard about it. People are starting to, when they had casting call, people were tagging me on their posts about it. And so I went ahead and I applied for it. And I was in the final stages and they sent me the contract and I actually turned it down uh, because I was, I, they, they were, it is literally like you have a one in 456 chance to win the money, which I mean, it's a lot of money, but you have one in, it's like one in almost 500. Like that's small. It's small. And I said, like, so what are you going to do with the money? I go, I would give a million of it to charity. I would give, you know, maybe a million to my parents and I don't know what we'll do the rest. Um, but it really, it came down to is what they did was they said the contract made, you were locked into that contract where you cannot do any other TV show. And I have oh. three shows that we're pitching right now. And if you are in the first one, you are ob contractually obligated to be held on. The, the contract can um, repeat itself for season two. Whether they choose you or not, you are under their control. And after seeing that, I'm like, yeah, forget it. Are you serious? Yeah, so I turned it down. And I probably could have made They said literally there's like, basically they said, if you sign the contract, basically you're going to be on the show. But I probably would have been kicked out in the first thing when they kicked out over half the people on red light, green light. That would have like tripped on the like the right after the, the beginning line and then like gone and now like years of my life and I can't do anything. You so. know what's so true? It's so funny that you said that because when I watched that, like it's very random, right? Like how or or when you're like the second or the, what was the second one when you get put in the umbrella? I, or I the haven't triangle? seen all of it. Yeah, I've only seen the first uh, episode and a half. So okay, don't so give all of it away. But th my point is, it's not. It's one of those things where let's let's just stick to the yes. red light, green light, because that's what you saw. Yeah. It it could be so random. Yeah. Like you just didn't that one second you didn't stop or whatever yeah. it you is. You can't necessarily will yourself to win that game. You and cannot. I thought, you know what? I've got pretty strong will, but in the end, like I mean, there are people on that show who are like destitute, who like need the money a lot more than I do. And am I going to lie, cheat, and steal my way through them? Like I don't know that I could do that. Are they really destitute? I mean, I didn't. I'm assuming that's what you hear. I haven't seen it, but that's what I've heard. Okay. So. I, I'm only on episode four of this okay. one, but I will say that also like you can be randomly eliminated, which is not in your control. Yeah. And that's, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then I, your whole, again, and then your whole, that yeah. is such a great story. I didn't yeah, know, so, but no. you do look identical. <laughs> I was at a BTS concert and we were on the main floor and I had, I had these people come up to me, Dr. Yim, can I, can we get your auto or can I take a picture with you? I'm like, yeah, sure. And all of a sudden there's this huge line of people wanting to take pictures with me. <laughs> And I started realizing after a few of them that they weren't saying my name anymore. They were just taking pictures of me. So I looked down on one. I'm like, who do you think I am? And they go, you're that guy from Squid Game. And I'm like, no, I'm not. And so I go to the, like, there's literally 40 people lined up on the floor of, um, of the arena. It was in Las Vegas at the time. And, uh, and I go, look, I'm not on Squid Game. I'm a doctor on social media. And the entire line dispersed. Well, that is <laughs> and hilarious. my wife and kids are laughing at me. <laughs> they thought it was so funny. That is hilarious. Now, if there was moms with them, they'd want to ask you some like plastic yes. surgery question. I forgot to even say at the beginning of the podcast, you call you, you, you consider yourself a holistic plastic surgeon, not even a regular plastic surgeon because, yeah. uh, contrary to every other plastic surgeon in the entire on the entire planet, you try to persuade people not to have surgery, to do everything you can preventatively or not to have it at all, which is 
Like, no, maybe yes. that's why you had no business at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that could be it too, right? Like, well, I started my practice as a traditional plastic surgeon, and I thought I had reached the pinnacle of success. And, you know, we are taught in surgery the sayings, to cut is to cure. The only way to heal is with cold steel. And mm -hmm. we're taught basically that the goal of being a surgeon is to bring people to surgery. But the problem with, with that being a goal, I realized uh, after many years of practice and where I thought I'd reached the pinnacle, is that that goal is false. Like it's not the right thing. When you truly are doing things for the patient, then your goal should be the opposite. It should be, how do I keep people out of the operating room, yet still make them happy with their appearance? And it only happened, it, that only really hit me after I had a big tragedy in my practice and a patient had a terrible complication. Oh. And I realized it wasn't her fault, it wasn't my fault, just sometimes bad things happen. Uh, but it really got me into thinking uh, really, really hard about what I was taught, what I was doing, uh, the dogma in plastic surgery in general, and it really got me into questioning everything. And so that's what started kind of a path of this holistic plastic surgeon. The idea is using plastic surgery only as a last resort. And so after this happened, you know, all of my training was in surgery, post-surgical complications. You know, it was really basically being a surgeon. We got very little training, almost none on nutrition, on skincare. Like we spent zero time with dermatologists in my residency, which you think you should, you know, but there's turf wars between plastic surgeons and dermatologists. So they didn't want us to, to meet with them. And so I spent, uh, after a certain period of time in my practice, I spent a lot of time learning from alternative health practitioners, from nutritionists, from dietitians, from skincare specialists, and figured out kind of this whole idea of auto-juvenation, but using your body's own regenerative abilities to rejuvenate itself. Yeah. And that kind of became the basis of my book, Younger for Life. Yeah. I mean, I was going to ask you about that. That's I, I didn't even get to my, any of my questions yet because I'm actually, what I was, I was very fascinated about how are you able to do both things as a full, like being on social media, at the level that you're on with mm -hmm. content creation is a full-time plus job. That takes like what you're doing in terms of videos and editing. You must have a team of what, five, 10 people working with you? No, I have one person. I have a video editor. So like some of my fancier videos, I have him do that. And, uh, you're doing and I do have editors for my YouTube videos. So I'll send them the raw footage and then they'll edit that together. Um, but basically I make two type, well, three types of content. Everything else is repurposed. So I make TikTok videos, which mm -hmm. I repurpose to reels and shorts and stuff like that. And then I make long form YouTube videos, one or two a week. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll make occasionally, you know, kind of funny memes and stuff for Instagram. And that's basically it. Everything else is basically repurposed from those three types of content. Okay. But how many hours a week are you spending on doing social media yourself? And then having a practice, like, are you practicing? Yeah, I have a, uh, a full-time plastic surgery practice. Like you're so, doing full-time, yes. you're a full-time so doctor. So I see patients every Monday and Wednesday all day. And then every Tuesday and Thursday, I operate anywhere from five to eight hours. And then Friday mornings I used to operate, but literally I'm stopping at the end of this year because I'm restarting my podcast uh, and interviews and stuff. On my oh, podcast. you are? Yeah. What kind of yeah. podcast are you going to have? It's, well, I've had it actually for many years called oh. the Holistic Plastic Surgery Show. And okay. so I did a lot of interviews with healthcare practitioners and things like that. A lot of solo stuff, just about how to look younger naturally. Mm -hmm. um, I like but that. honestly, I found that um, once my YouTube channel really exploded and then the TikTok stuff, I started losing a little bit of interest in it um, because I think the other stuff was doing so, so well. Totally. Um, and so I started doing less episodes and I took six months off and stuff. Now I'm like, look, I really, after doing, I'm doing these podcast tours, I'm like, you know, I should really get back into it. This would be a lot of fun. So I'm re, re kind of getting back into it starting this new year. Well, like who's, so do you have someone who's, because I'm under the impression that, because YouTube for me has been a real like a dip that was a, that's a difficult mm -hmm. i think that I, I, that's a very difficult platform to break into i find it very hard i mean do you find that you it's like how did you is it how did you kind of make it work did you not have someone different to kind of i've been told oh you have experts for for youtube you have experts for yeah. uh i you know instagram or can you is it really more like kind of one of these things where if you're content catches the algorithm and then you have that momentum and it just starts to grow naturally is it luck what part would you say no is true? it's all skill it's all knowing okay. what hits and and there's there's a lot i mean i have taken a lot of courses on youtube content creation and marketing of it um, i don't do any ads or any of that type of stuff um, but really what it comes down to is if you're starting a channel is you want to try to connect the a simple way to do it is connect the unknown with the known 
So if you have a channel on YouTube and it's you don't have a lot of followers, you're the quote unquote unknown. So what is the known? Well, celebrities are the known. Um, current events are the known. And so what you want to do is have you combined with something that that is, um, you know, that is in the in the zeitgeist, I suppose. Right, so what did well for me uh, initially? Um, plastic surgery about celebrities, mm -hmm. you know. So connecting the unknown, which would be me with a celebrity. Uh, Kim Kardashian, for example. Um, now I do things like reaction videos to different TV shows and and things like that. Um, so what's known, like the show Bosch, like Dr. Pimple Popper, mm -hmm. and and doing things like that. So now you're connecting the known with the unknown. You need one video to pop off for your channel to really start growing. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And most what... channels really only have two or three videos at most that are powering most of their views and most of their subscriber base. Um, so it really comes down to being consistent doing the known with the unknown. Um, those are kind of the two big things. That's really interesting. And I, I agree with you. And I've seen that be the case for a lot of like a lot of people, but it doesn't always work. Like, for example, OK, I would have on my podcast people who are really big on YouTube, like who mm -hmm. are like with big names. That particular thing did quite well. Mm -hmm. But it didn't carry me through to get to the next thing. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, did that video do well? Yeah. And so maybe it kind of like got some traction on a few other ones. But by no means am I like getting millions of subscribers on YouTube because of it. I think you got to look at YouTube also differently than, let's say, a podcast. Although YouTube is really getting mm -hmm. into podcasting. But if you look at the most successful people on YouTube, like watch Mr. Beast. Of course. And you see like the cuts are so quick. So fast. You know, and you don't want to have... Um, a lot of extra space because people have such short attention spans. You yeah. know, it's like there's TikTok where you got to go super, super quick and like don't make it five seconds longer than it needs to be. And YouTube is not quite that fast, but it is the same idea. And the editing is absolutely key in those situations. 100%. I, I again, I cannot agree with you more. I mean, We'll talk after this yes. show. Maybe you can help me because like, yeah, I, mean, I first was like, he can get me a free consultation on wow, how I can do this or what I need to do. But I mean, who would have thought that I'd get, uh, um, what do you call it? Like how to look younger consultation, <laughs> how, to, how to do social media better consultation, all wrapped up in one there guest, you, go. you know? There you go. Uh, this is, that's very interesting. Are you making money then from YouTube because of YouTube, all YouTube? I make the most money off of I, all the platforms by far, by far, by right? far, like not anywhere close with the other ones. Like, are you by just advertisers, right? Like just by yes. them? Well, so the, what I do is it's AdSense revenue. So you get the ads that show up on your videos, Yeah. but on top of that, I have my own product. So I've got my skincare line, you beauty. Yeah. And so what I do is I'll have a video and then I'll put a mid roll ad of my products in my video, just like you may like on a podcast course, episode, yeah. you put an episode, you put an ad like on my podcast, I'll have a, an ad for my products in it. Right. Um, Why not? And so it's the same. So now I'll have mid roll ads from advertisers and I'll have my own. And yeah, you know, two thirds of people may skip through it, but there's still that one third, one half of people that will actually still watch it somehow. 100%. Um, and I can see as my YouTube videos go up, my sales go up with that. That's so, so if you don't mind me asking, it is kind of a business podcast. What can you say, you, what would you make monthly from just YouTube alone? Um, just with from five AdSense mil, with revenue, five million subscribers. AdSense revenue. Yeah. So my issue is, is that um, I have 5 million subscribers, but not all of them are uh, long form video subscribers. A good uh, chunk of them are short form video and you don't make much at all off a of short form. No, no. Off of long form video for, you know, if you have, let's say a million subscribers, which I think in my, you know, of the 5 million, I'd say maybe 1.5 are long form subscribers for me and the other uh, what 3.5 look at my math 3.5 yeah. or short form Sink to surgery yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the 1.5 you know you could make um just for adsense revenue anywhere from on the low side um eight to ten thousand a month to the high side fifty thousand a month uh depending on where your views are at and that's just for your just ad, adsense yeah. revenue that that's has it. nothing to do with product sales or anything like that nothing yeah and youtube is a one platform i mean facebook is good with that too where you can put as many links as you want Right. Uh, unlike right. Instagram and TikTok, where they're so limited and so frustrating. It's, yeah, you don't make money off it. That's why everyone's trying to get off of Instagram to make. You don't use that as a platform to make money. I don't make anything off of Instagram no. at all. Like that's frustrating because I've got a lot of Instagram followers, and I and so for me, I try to do more sponsored stuff and and things like that on Instagram to make it worth my while. Right. Exactly. Do you do sponsor stuff a lot? Like you, mm -hmm. even though you have your own product, like I, I guess you have to be very specific on yeah. your. 
What are the videos, in your opinion, that really kind of track the highest? Is it with celebrities? Is it with a particular body type? Like, what are the best? Um, well, for me, it, it just depends, I think, on your audience. Like, for me, the audience likes me um, explaining or reacting to, like, kind of crazy things. So, like, I just had one pop off the other day. Um, oh, <laughs> Um, this is, and, I, and I'm, it's not my field, but it's when women are having their period and they get pain in their rectum, like severe pain in their rectum. Um, what? Some women get this severe pain in the rectum area during periods. And there was a video where a, a woman basically was, you know, humming along and all of a sudden like, ah, and like fell on the ground. And so I kind of explained that this was due to the prostaglandin release during, uh, you know, menstruation. And this does happen to people. You can get, you know, constriction and some people, that's why they get period poops. Um, the same idea is that the prostaglandin causes your intestines to kind of sometimes be a little irritable. And that one like exploded. I think it hit 10 million views or something like that. Are you joking? No, it's serious. Oh my, okay, but so, if you don't know about it, then good for you. That's I mean, great. I you don't mean, have to is, deal is with it. Wrong? Is there something wrong with me that I've never heard of no, that before? Well, it's, it is something, you know, I posted this because I found it interesting and I mean, it's thousands and thousands of comments of people like, I have that, I have that. Well, thank you so much for explaining it to me because I thought I thought something was wrong with me. Interesting. Uh, and so I try to do a lot of things like that where either I will debunk things that are like, come on, that's not true. You know, like things like face yoga, you know, oh, if you make these movements with your face, your wrinkles will go away. Okay, yes, like, that's, I was going to ask you about that. So can you do some debunking for me? Yeah. I wanted to ask you, so there's all these, there's, there is all of these things that oh if you do all of these movements around your yeah, face yeah. it will help like contour yeah. your face and lift yeah, your face snatches your face snatches yeah, your yeah. face is that not true um it it won't create a permanent effect so what you're talking about is using either like rollers Roller. or, a, or a gua sha device a gua sha yeah and those are nice because what they'll do is they will push out like lymphatic fluid mm -hmm. so if you if you're puffy like let's say you eat chinese food one night and the next morning you wake up and you're all puffy yes that's great to kind of push that fluid out but it's not going to do anything permanent you know, it just won't like it. There's nothing that you can do to change the actual architecture of your face by massaging it on the outside. It just doesn't make sense when you really think about it. So face yoga. So face yoga is completely so just face yoga is a little bit different because face yoga then is the act of making these extreme facial expressions like they'll puff out their cheeks really wide and move their tongue all around their mouth and then they'll elevate their brows and then get real squinty and stuff. Yeah. And the belief is that if you exercise the muscles every your face that that will cause your skin to be tighter you know because like what you exercise other muscles it makes them stronger they think oh well you're sagging because the muscles are stretched out and weak if you strengthen them then your face will be lifted and the fact is that this that just isn't true because these muscles the muscles of facial expression that you're using to make these movements those are not the reason why things sag okay those muscles don't sag they may get a little thinner and atrophy a little bit as you get older but what you're doing though is you're doing the opposite of botox when you think about it okay botox is a neurotoxin that prevents the transmission of nerve impulses to muscle and so if you inject it into let's say the muscles of your frown lines the glabella between the eyebrows it will prevent those muscles from contracting and the wrinkles smooth out yeah now when you're doing all these extreme facial expressions what you're doing is you are are making those wrinkles over and over and over again. And eventually it's like mom says, like if you keep making that face, it's gonna stay that yeah. way. <laughs> those wrinkles will get set in. It's like those people who always sleep on one side of the pillow and they don't have a satin or silk pillow and they get sleep wrinkles and they do it year after year after year. Eventually they have lines on that side of the face because those pillow wrinkles, sleep wrinkles become permanent. Um, and so face yoga, actually studies have been done on face yoga. And what the one thing face yoga does actually is it actually will, like you think, if you work those muscles out, what happens to muscles when you work them out? They get bigger. Yeah. So in some people, they actually will gain a little bit of volume in their face. And some people say, well, it's an alternative to fillers. And theoretically, that's probably true. The problem is, is then you're going to trade it for deeper lines. Oh, my gosh. I didn't even think of it that way. That is 100%. That sounds that sounds like it would make sense. Yeah. So does that mean then, is that why sleeping with this? Okay, explain well, before we get into the satin or the silk pillow, that is by far a great a great option for people, right? Mm -hmm. Because it does does it limit the amount of wrinkles and fine lines? Yeah, because you're not having quite the friction, you know. I mean, it's it's smoother, and so the idea is that your face is not going to be kind of caught up in that, you know, yeah. squished squished state for hours on end. Absolutely. Give us a couple other debunking. Debunk some other. Uh, another big thing is mewing. Have you heard of mewing? No, what's that? So mewing is, you know, if if you take a photograph and you elevate your tongue to the roof of your mouth. Mm -hmm. 
it causes your neck to look tighter and to look higher. Uh, and it really works. So if you look at me, oh my you see God. how my neck lifts? So a lot of people will do this for photos and they'll say, hey, they'll take a photo, then they'll put their tongue to the roof of their mouth and their, and their uh, neckline looks better. And this is a trick of, of models. For, I mean, you live in LA, you should know I this. I don't know any of this, yes, <laughs> I know. I'm like living under a rock apparently. Yes. Um, so that's a trick for people. If you don't like how your chin looks uh, from the side, from profile, then just lift your tongue to the roof of your mouth when you smile and it will look tighter. Like you look tighter when you do that. Now, there is this belief, it's called mewing, that if you do that consistently, that you will lift your actual, and you can reshape your jawline. And that just is not true. And there are people who have videos that show, oh, look, if you do it over and over again, then you will cause the jawline to look tighter. And it's just, once again, not true at all. Oh, my God. Give me another one. Give me a little tip, um, a tip and trick like that. Something that has gone viral that people believe. Um, I'm trying to think what else would be big that people have done. Um, so, I mean, I could say one of the things that you see a lot of, uh, you know, actually one thing people have been asking me a lot is there's this thing called air sculpt. Have you heard of air sculpt? No. So this is something that's real hot on in circles. Um, and actually the other one I could talk to you is about implants and saunas. So I know you're a big sauna fan. So yes. we'll talk about that. Um, all right. So, um, Air sculpt, some, I've had people ask me on podcasts, what is air sculpt? Is that better than liposuction? And the answer is no. This is kind of a hot thing. A lot of people are saying, oh, air sculpt, you know, I've had air sculpt and it's the no stitch liposuction and blah, blah, blah. The problem that you see in plastic surgery is there are a lot of marketing gimmicks that come up. People use it to make a lot of money for a short period of time, and then it goes by the wayside, and then they're on to the next thing. Yeah. Uh, there was something called the um, Lifestyle Lift many years ago, where they had these commercials on TV, and it was like a lunchtime facelift. It was all over the media, probably in the early yeah, 2000s. I remember the lunchtime facelift. What is that? I don't remember what it was, though. Basically, it's it's a they they presented it as a facelift under, under a local anesthetic that is revolutionary, and people were like, before, and then they'd be all frowning and looking angry, then after, and be all smiling with this tight jawline. And yeah. it was actually devised by a doctor actually from Mich around Michigan State University where I graduated from in, in Michigan. And in the end, this was just a gimmick. Eventually they went bankrupt because they patients eventually figured out that it just was a freaking facelift under under local anesthetic. Nothing special about it. What do you mean? How, how do you even get a facelift with no with only local anesthetic? You you it only inject it into a small area and you only lift a small area. And so you don't get much of a result from oh. it. But they would promote this as this revolutionary thing. The photographs would be completely ridiculous because the before photograph, no makeup, frowning, you know, they're looking, they're looking down. So everything looks really bad. And the after, they've got professional makeup, they're smiling, their chin is lifted. And it's like, come on, then there are enough people if, if you air it how many times on commercials, yeah. infomercials, people will sign up for it. And 100%. it was huge for a while. Uh, and then very quickly died away and, and went bankrupt because people figured out it was just a big scam. And was it just like uh, like filler coming in here? Or what was it? No, they, they actually did a facelift and they would make these incisions. What? They wouldn't hide them because they they would hire these doctors, like kind of doc in the box docs, plastic surgeons who are either really, really young or really, really old, yeah. who was just l looking for hourly work. Yeah. And they would do these mini minimal facelifts and get people and then not even see them afterwards. It was It's this scam. And you see this, unfortunately, around the country. Yeah. You know, there are, in plastic surgery, there are a lot of charlatans. There are a lot of people who are um, op honestly unethical and they do it just to make money um, because it's the one field where you can go out there, you could put a shingle up, you can say you're the greatest doctor in town by a bunch of ads and people will believe it because, hey, it's written there. And 100%. then they have surgery, they get botched, and then they don't, you know, then what do they do? Uh, it's, it's all over the country. So, wait, what is AirSculpt then? So, AirSculpt is just another one of those new things of like, oh, it's the latest, greatest thing. Now, this is something, uh, this is my opinion, oh, yeah, legal reasons. I, I, this is completely <laughs> my opinion. I, I don't do it. Um, but just it's another one of these marketing gimmicks. Uh, this is a less invasive, quote unquote, liposuction. But where, how, how does it work? It's just you, you. It's a local anesthetic, and you perform liposuction. <laughs> oh, so basically, it is liposuction, but like with a different name. Yes, essentially. Yeah, I mean, and, and they, you know, people mark. You know, they kind of talk it up as like, oh, it's minimally invasive, no stitch. You know, all this stuff. But come on, it's still liposuction. And also, I was I was told again, is this true that liposuction? If you suck out fat in one place, it'll come back in another place. I don't think that's true. 
Um, okay, there are some true. people that believe you have so many fat cells, and if you're moving from one area, that can come back to another area. Yeah. There was one small study many, many years ago that appeared to show that, if, let's say, if you had lipo done in your calves, then your forearms would get bigger afterwards. Um, but that, that has since been debunked by much, much larger studies. Um, the fact is, if you have liposuction done, you're having fat removed from a part of your body, there's still fat cells left there. So if you gain weight, you're still going to gain some fat. But the idea behind lipo is you remove it from problem areas, so you hopefully make yourself, quote unquote, more proportional. And then if you do gain weight, they, you hopefully gain weight in a similar fashion. It doesn't always go to that kind of problem area. Okay, so I want to know this. So how could someone without surgery, how can you, how can somebody tighten their face in a real way? Like, no, like not with fillers, not with eating salmon. Yeah. I'm talking about how can, is, is it even possible to tighten someone's face without yes. ever having surgery? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I would look at, there's two things I would do. I mean, skincare can help, but it's not going to be this dramatic thing. Okay. okay. So if you're going to go with skincare, then you want to use a retinoid, ideally like a retinol. Mm -hmm. um, that's tried and true. Most dermatologists, plastic surgeons, you pick one anti-aging ingredient, they'll say use a retinol. Yeah. Um, but that's not going to lift skin that's technically getting loose. Right. Okay. the body will heal that by making it stronger, by making it actually, in our situation, younger. Mm -hmm. So 70, 80% of, of our skin is composed of collagen. Collagen is a large protein that is in these kind of fibers. And when I describe it, it's like the logs of a log cabin. Mm -hmm. And when you're young, those logs are nice and new. They're tough, they're shiny, they're smooth. And as you get older, those logs start to fall apart a bit. Now, anytime you do whether it's a laser using laser light energy, a chemical peel, use it, which uses an acid, mm -hmm. um, microneedling, which creates an acute trauma by putting a needle into the skin. Mm -hmm. You create acute trauma to that collagen. The collagen gets damaged. And when it heals, it heals in a tighter fashion. Mm. Okay. It's kind of like the same idea of, of a cold plunge out there where you put your body under a certain amount of controlled stress. And as long as you don't go too far and cause real damage, you're going to cause your body to rebound by actually being stronger, by being more youthful afterwards. So you're saying, because I tried Morpheus 8, I had a, a, a friend of mine who's a doctor who just got the machine and I go, oh, I can try it on you. First of all, I wasn't that red and it, I, I, I got it a couple of times. I don't okay. think it did anything. Didn't do much? No. Like it, I think that- so, so what happens with all of these treatments is it really comes down to your body's reaction to it. So I get Morpheus 8 every maybe four months in my neck area. Oh, that's a lot. Um, so maybe I gotta get, maybe it's something that you could, how often would I have to get Morpheus? So usually we recommend getting three to four treatments to start out with. Mm -hmm. And I have seen some pretty impressive results with oh. three to four, but it really is patient dependent because what you're doing is you're, once again, you're damaging that collagen and you're seeing how that collagen tightens. There's some people where it's really aggressive and that collagen really tightens up. You see a really nice change. And then they're the unlucky folk where they just, the collagen doesn't respond like you'd want it to. Right, so it doesn't happen, it doesn't work for everybody. And therein is the issue with any of these non-invasive treatments yeah. where you're not literally cutting out a centimeter of skin in a facelift, where you're, where you're waiting for your body to react and to create this process on its own. It really can vary patient to patient, and it is very frustrating. So then... Would you say the more, maybe like I thought, well, maybe she wasn't, she wasn't aggressive enough. Like maybe it didn't um, go deep enough The maybe the, you know, it the could be that. Or... I mean, it could be that, but it could just be that your body is one that is just not as reactive to it. It's the collagen is not going to react as, as um, dramatically as maybe um, a good friend of yours who has the same thing done. Honey, this is honestly the story of my life, right? Like I, of course with me, nothing works. Nothing ever works. I mean, <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sorry. It's always that way, but like. And I'm not, I've never, I'm scared of like surgery. I'm scared yeah, of yeah, everything. Yeah, but looking at, I mean, we can talk this. Is there like, how would I, like, looking at me, what can I do for like sunspots? Not even me, like anybody for sunspots, for age spots. What's the best way to get rid of these things? Yeah. So the, the with sunspots, it's very simple. It's an inside outside approach. So the outside approach, essentially you want, well, it's technically it's the inside approach. You want to apply a good brightening cream. So you want one that contains kojic acid or niacinamide or licorice root extract. Yes. I gave you one. It's right there. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. So how do I use this brightening cream or has any, so basically to get rid of a sunspot, you should use brightening cream. 
so these will basically, so what spots are essentially, they are clumps of melanin due to sun exposure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you get too much UV exposure, your body, your skin will react by creating melanin because melanin helps to absorb those rays and basically protects your skin from them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you get a lot, and you've, especially if you've got light colored skin, you can get these deposits of, of, of melanin called sunspots, A spots, liver spots, all the same names for the same thing or different names for the same thing. Okay. And the only way to get rid of them is to actively remove them, okay? So if you don't do anything with your spots, they will stay there basically forever. So the way you remove them is you suppress the melanin and you turn the skin over, okay? So a brightening cream will su will suppress the melanin. Excuse me. Yeah, bless you. Thank you. Uh, will suppress the melanin, and but if you combine that with exfoliation, exfoliation will cause your cells to turn over, your skin to turn over more quickly, then you can bring those cells to the surface that contain that pigment and eventually they slough off, okay? So that's how you wanna tackle it from a cream perspective is do a brightening cream and then add some type of an exfoliator, whether it's an alpha hydroxy acid or whether it's a retinol uh, that turns your skin over more quickly, that will eventually cause those spots to go away. But that takes a long time. You're talking six to eight weeks minimum to really see those results. And then let's go back to the tightening for a second. So I want people to, I mean, I didn't want to cut you off because I bet you if someone's listening, they'll be like, yeah, I want to know these things. And then I might yeah. move on from Morpheus. So before, besides Morpheus 8, which you say is that it can work for tightening your skin, what else can tight, tighten your skin? Um, so naturally without going and getting a having surgery. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, skin tightening is always a challenge. There are a lot of treatments that will create a somewhat similar effect. Prior to Morpheus 8, there was a treatment called all therapy that was probably considered the gold standard. Mm -hmm. And that's using ultrasound energy to heat up the deep skin. I didn't see, I, I, I never used it, but I heard from my patients maybe two thirds of people had a reasonable result from it just through the grapevine. Right. Um, and so I was never a huge fan of that. Um, sometimes even just like fractional laser treatments can help as well. So, but the problem is, is all of them are gonna act in the same manner of causing heat to the collagen to cause it to tighten up. And, and there's only so much tightening that you're gonna get without going really invasive. Okay, and so the other, then, you, you said retinol. Is that, but does retinol help tighten your skin or does it just help make Modestly. your skin? Modestly. It's yeah. very modest. Very. So what yeah. is, what is retinol really good for? So retinol essentially, it's a derivative of vitamin A um, and there's prescription strength retin-A and there's over-the-counter strength retinol. Most of us, we recommend retinol because it's over-the-counter. Most people can get it. And most yeah. skincare lines, inexpensive ones even have, a lot of them have a retinol in, in them. Okay. So, so it's very available. Uh, when you actually look at the studies, the studies are mainly done on Retin-A, the prescription strength version. And it has been shown in many studies to tighten the skin a bit, to um, exfoliate the skin, to thicken the dermis, the, the deeper layer of the skin. It's even been shown to reverse early pre-skin cancers. And so people who have really? a history of skin cancers, not a bad idea to get yourself on Retin-A because it may reverse some of the uh, atypias, the kind of unusual and the um, mal malfunctioning cells potentially in your skin. What a great tip. So to maybe prevent skin cancer, being on retinol or retin-A can actually help prevent. There is a belief that that may help. Yeah. Now, I don't know of any studies on retinol because that's the over-the-counter strength, but there definitely are studies on retin-A. Retin -A. And retinol, essentially, it um, when you apply it, okay, it's, it's over-the-counter strength because when you apply it, it's inactive, but it undergoes two chemical reactions after you apply it to your skin to become retin-A. And that's when it starts working. Interesting, because I know every single dermatologist will always, or anybody who knows skin will say that is the number one key to younger skin is retinol or retin-A. But yeah, really you're saying it's all about retin-A, the, the medical grade that that's people are like what really, most of the studies are on. But it's right. hard to tolerate and that is the problem. So a lot of people don't tolerate retinol or retin-A at all. If you've got real dry skin, if you've got real sensitive skin, um, then it, some people just can't tolerate. And so if you can't, then the thing I would recommend would be bakuchiol. Uh, bakuchiol is a plant-based alternative to, to retinol. Um, it's made from the babchi plant. This is something that's been around in Ayurveda and Chinese medicine for centuries. Okay. And there was a study that compared retinol to bakuchiol for its anti-aging effects and found a very similar uh, result from both of those. Uh, the difference is, is that retinol created more skin irritation than bakuchiol. 
Um, so if you've got sensitive skin and you've tried retinol and you're like, geez, I can't tolerate, it makes my skin dry, it makes it flaky, it makes it red or itchy, yeah. then try bakuchiol instead. Bakuchiol. Bakuchiol, yeah, because that will work itself. That that may work better for you and it's very easy on the skin. And I think I brought you one. You have bakuchiol, you have it? Yeah, yeah, I brought you one. Oh my God, okay, so you need to give me like a whole recipe on how to use all the yeah, oh my yeah, gosh my yeah so, i so, forgot i forgot i mailed you products and i brought you products that i could fit on okay, my in I'll my carry-on <laughs> this is amazing because you also have in here a peptide so uh peptides are like the hottest thing right now yes and do you want to talk about that yes but that? in skincare it's not quite the same you know i mean i think peptides are something it's such a broad a broad um category, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, because semaglutide is a peptide, you know. Semaglutide is a peptide? Oh, yeah, yeah. So peptides are basically just proteins. I mean, peptide essentially is a protein. And they, and they yeah, will yeah, yeah. they act as cellular uh, messengers and telling your cells to do this or that. In skincare, we can apply it on our skin. It can cause our uh, skin to create more collagen. It's a messenger. It's a protein that acts as a messenger to create more collagen. Um, but there are peptides like semaglutide is a type of peptide that obviously causes uh, your GI tract to slow down and not to empty as quickly. Right. Uh, and then there are peptides that are being used for anti-aging purposes as well and, and a lot being used in kind of more experimental and, uh, and that type of a thing. Have you heard of One Skin Care with the OS01 uh, peptide? I have heard a little bit about that. Um, I've heard some podcasts uh early stuff, but not a lot. It's something that's a, a different company. And so I'm always kind of wary when it's a company saying, hey, this is the newest thing. And they're the ones saying it. I want to see it from, let's say, dermatologists and other practitioners first who aren't maybe, you know, doing it as a sponsored type of a deal. Right. No, I understand what you're saying. I mean, uh, because they have this, I thought they had the proprietary, hmm. uh, what do you call it? Like a patent that mm -hmm. people have really, really liked it. Um, so I thought since- There's a lot out there in skincare, but I think what lots. people need to realize is that you don't have to be real fancy with it, you know, because it's it's like skincare, there's always kind of this shiny object that's here or that's here. Like, oh, this is better than Botox. I'm gonna use that. Oh, then, then this is here. Um, and really what it comes down to is that most people- you know, really, I have something I, I recommend. It's called the two minutes, five years younger skincare regimen. And so this is something that literally takes two minutes a day. And we tested people on it. We had them, people who just, you know, they they weren't, they didn't come in with horrible skin, but they also aren't people like you where you've got really nice skin, like people with kind of average skin. Okay. And so we put them on it. It literally takes two minutes a day. And after two months of doing this, we uh, surveyed people on Instagram of how much younger does their skin look. And, and we got an average of about five years younger. And it's super, super simple. That's part of my my book. Um, so in the morning, cleanse your skin with a cleanser appropriate for your skin type. So if you've got oily skin, you want to use a foaming cleanser. If you've got drier or more sensitive skin, then use a hydrating or a milky cleanser. After that, you want to apply an antioxidant serum. Uh, vitamin C is the most common. Uh, if you want to biohack a little bit, then combining vitamin C and vitamin E will get actually a synergistic effect for antioxidant and will protect your skin even better. Um, so you apply an antioxidant serum, typically vitamin C, and most skincare lines have a vitamin C serum in them. If you want to get it even better, then add the vitamin E with it too. And then I do recommend uh, using a sunscreen, especially if you're going to be out at least SPF 30. That's all you have to do in the morning, okay? Cleanser, vitamin C, sunscreen, you're done. Uh, in the evening, got to cleanse your skin. Most important thing, if you only wash your face once a day, make it at night, got to get rid of the day's worth of dust, grime, dirt, and I saw that in your book. Uh, yeah. yeah, all that stuff. Um, and then you want to apply ideally a retinol. Um, if you've got real sense of skin, then go with Bakuchiol. And then if you want to apply a moisturizer on top of that, feel free, but you don't have to. If you've got oily skin, there's no reason to apply moisturizer. You've got natural moisturizer. Okay. So moisturizers are not truly anti-aging. They are for comfort. They're for hydration. And that's all you have to do at night. Now, once a week, if you have sensitive skin, two or three times a week, if you have got quote unquote normal skin, then I do recommend that you exfoliate. You can do it with a gentle scrub or you can do it with uh, like an alpha hydroxy acid type of like at home peel. And that's it. If you just do those steps, you're going to be way ahead of like 95% of people. Wow, that's okay. So that's so simple because you're right. I mean, it's a it's a huge industry. It's a multi billion dollar industry. Yes. And everyone will people will try anything to look better, look younger, all the things. So, but you didn't say a couple things that I've heard are very very important, which sure. is hyaluronic acid. 
So hyaluronic acid is nice. And actually, I got you a probiotic and hyaluronic acid serum as well. Okay. That is an add-on. Mm -hmm. Okay. So hyaluronic acid is a naturally occurring moisturizer of the skin. If you've got real dry skin, if you live here in LA, if you're in Arizona, if you're in Nevada, and you want to add some good moisture to your skin, by all means, hyaluronic acid is great. Okay. So where were, so you would put that on. And then the other thing that you didn't mention, um, well, you actually kind of did mention that. You said, oh, is there like a difference in terms of... Uh, like the night creams, like in terms of the types of night creams that you should be using versus day creams. And also vitamin C at night is a no-no, right? Uh, it's not necessary. It's not, it's not necessary. Yeah, because vitamin C is an antioxidant in general. Now, vitamin C is definitely important for the production of collagen. But right, okay. so you're not washing your face. I only wash my face, sorry, at night. Okay. And I use water in the morning. Okay. And that's so that yeah, I'm not you getting the, the benefits well, of the Well, sometimes I do that too, because like if I shower at night, then I yeah. sometimes won't cleanse my skin in the morning. I'll I'll rinse it off essentially too. Right, right, right. Um so yeah, vitamin C essentially though is a protectant. It's an antioxidant. It protects your skin against free radicals. Mm. And so you're you know, throughout the day you're exposed to free radicals from the sun. The sun creates free radicals from pollution, from cigarette smoking around you, and from the food that you eat. I mean, especially if you're eating ultra processed foods, that actually it contains free radicals. And so yeah. the vitamin C will protect your skin from it. But while you're sleeping, your skin's not being attacked by free radicals so much because you're lying in bed right. and you're asleep. And ideally, that's when you want to apply the retinol. Now, retinol, you don't apply in the morning because it gets actually deactivated by the sunlight. Right. So then you just waste your money on it. What about red light? Like red light therapy, like so, wearing the mask and or where putting red light on you for fine lines and wrinkles. And yeah. Stuff. So if you're listening to this podcast and you are on a strict budget and you want to do something, and let's say you you live in an area where you don't have access to a med spa or dermatologist and you want to do it yourself, red light therapy is number one, great bang for your buck. So just like you said, it can come in handheld devices where you treat a quadrant of your face at a time. You can get those creepy looking Hannibal Lecter masks that a lot do of they people work. Are. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So there actually is studies to show that red light therapy will improve your skin. There was a split face study where they actually took half the face. They didn't actually split somebody's face, but they treated half the face with a sham laser, one that didn't do anything, uh, and one with a red light laser, a light device, yeah. and found a significant improvement in wrinkles, hydration, and elasticity of the skin, and an improvement in the collagen content of the skin with red light therapy. Wow. And is it different? Because do you know, and I'm sure you do, the the difference in quality like this is a shout out for therisage and this is because it's actually true because they have this panel of like a red light panel mm -hmm. that I, I put on my face but i use it everywhere i use it when i have like a bad ankle yeah a, when i have an injury i just wrap my whatever it is and it really does help after a while and mm -hmm. so i do think there is a difference in terms of the quality of a red light you're using because there's mm -hmm. companies out there who have that, that it doesn't, there's pharmaceutical grade and there's other ones. Are you familiar with this whole idea or you think they're all the same? Um, to an extent, yeah. I mean, I have some friends of mine who are really, really into it and they have their own. Like there's one, uh, the Loom Box is one that I'm uh, that an one. affiliate for that I think is really good. Just a tabletop fight about one. it? <laughs> I think <they laughs> You try this one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think that, yeah, and there's so many different ones out there. But yes, I agree. I think that there are ones where you have companies that are based uh, overseas and they are mass producing these and sending them yeah. uh, into the US and then companies will put their label on it. And then there are companies like the ones that you, you know, the one that you work with, the one that I work with, where these companies, this is what they do, you know, yeah. and, and, and they, the integrity of the company yeah. is so important to, I think, I mean, because I think the problem is people people see something that, you know, they talk about red, red light therapy and then people are like, oh yeah, well I can just go buy this one here or that one there because it's whatever. And the, there is yes. something about the quality and the integrity of what you're using out there. I would agree. Yeah. Because yeah. you can't just use like poor parts to create something and expect that you're going to have the same result as a company that is very, um, you know, focused on the creation of this product and the quality of, and the results, you know, I mean, I think that there definitely is a, a difference there. So do you know, it, I mean, can you tell people what to look for when they're looking for a red light? I can't you specifically, okay. no, because I think that's something you'd have to look at the company. You want to look at their studies, you know, what they have, their intra company studies and see, you know, kind of what they get with it. And a lot of it, honestly, is people like you who've used a product and yeah, say, Hey, you I know really what? Like it, yeah. I think it's a great product. Um, I mean, because sometimes it's hard to do studies with some of this stuff. 
And it, well, over time, exactly. I mean, even look at something like an Ozempic, right? Like people are just, everyone everyone and their dog is taking it. Yeah. I think I'm the only person in California, Los Angeles, who's not on this thing. Because yeah. you look around, everyone's like literally 10 pounds now, like yeah. so thin. Yeah. Um, and people don't think there's any side effects and you don't, you don't find out about the side effects until many, many years later. You know, the one later. thing I wonder with it, and I have patients of mine who are on Zempic and I think there are people who have type two diabetes and right. people who have issues where of it course. could potentially really help them. The one thing that I wonder, and th there are things I think in medicine where you can get an immediate result and you don't have an immediate complication and you assume that long-term it's going to be safe. Mm -hmm. And then you find out long later that it, that it may not. And so what I try to think about is theoretically what could go wrong. So when I think about Ozempic, you know, one thing is, you know, I do a lot of surgery still. I operate two days a week, um, sometimes three, and we have, I have patients of mine who are on, on Ozempic and we take them off at least two weeks prior to the operation. But I started thinking, you know, when you when you're dealing with colon cancer, okay, and let's say you have somebody who's on a really poor diet, we know that our food, especially if you're talking ultra processed foods are filled with free radicals, okay? What happens when you take food that's filled with free radicals, somebody eats it, it goes into their intestines, and their intestines don't move that food very quickly. And they're exposed to these free radicals for twice the length of time that they normally would, because normally you have peristalsis and a day after you eat something, it comes out the other end. What happens if it takes a lot longer for it to come out the other end? and your gut cells are exposed to this food for longer periods of time. Right. Could that potentially increase your risk of colon cancer in the future? I don't know. Is it possible? I mean, theoretically, it does sound a little bit concerning when you think about it. Now, yeah. I'm not a gastroenterologist. I'm not a gut health specialist. You know, I do know generally about gut health and about alternative medicine, but right. I haven't heard anybody talk about that. Is yeah. that a concern? You know, that's the same thing when we have, I have their plastic surgeons who will inject fat into women's breasts. They go, oh, this is safer than implants. Yeah. We'll inject fat. Well, theoretically, what happens when you take a cancer-prone organ, one where one in nine women will get breast cancer in their lifetime, and you inject fat, with, which is chock full of stem cells, into kind of haphazardly into a woman's breast? What if that woman has a cluster of dysplastic abnormal cells that are only going to turn into a cancer when she turns 140 years old because they're so slow growing? But now you inject a bunch of stem cells around those cells. Stem cells are basically cells that are so young that they will turn into essentially the organ that they're in. Will that maybe cause a breast cancer to show up when, they turn, when the woman turns 50 instead of 120? We don't know. And these are things that we need to keep in mind theoretically before we just kind of jump in and, and do this uh, an intervention, assuming that it's going to be fine. You just said something that's very interesting, but why, like if that, about stem cells to me, because that can happen. Like, let's say you don't take the fat from, let's say, your butt and put it into your boobs, which is, I know, something like you just keep it where it is. Mm -hmm. And then you inject stem cells somewhere in your body for like healing purposes. Mm -hmm. Does that because it because stem cells go all over the place. So you're saying that potentially when you're thinking you're doing something good for another reason, that can actually be it could uh, backfire, backfire potentially, yeah. and increase your ability for because it'll speed up the growth somewhere else. That's my fear. No, no. In, if if let's say you have a, a, a thousand abnormal cells in your breast, okay. it hasn't become a lump or anything yet. You don't yes. even know that they're yes. there. But now you inject a bunch of stem cells in and around that area. But why okay. would I be putting stem cells in there, not just in the, the breast? Yeah. Like if a, you're doing fat injections into a breast to make the breast bigger, essentially. Oh, so you use stem cells for that? I, I, so well, yeah, fat I'm like is completely... filled with stem cells. Oh. That's one thing we've learned. And one thing oh, one thing you don't hear okay. a lot about is, you know, they don't hear a lot about stem cell controversy of like, oh, you know, are you getting it from fetus, you know, fetuses and stuff like that? Because yeah. now what we can do is take our fat, which everybody's got a little extra, and you can use that yeah. to actually harvest stem cells from it. It's actually a great source of stem cells. And that's something we've only learned maybe in the last 10 or 15 years. Ah, so you're not safe. So what about just regular? Like if you're use, if you're getting stem cells or exosomes for an injury, and can that can that cause can that backfire then? Or well, right now you can't here in the United States. So you it's can't? only in an only in an FDA approved study. So a few years ago, they actually put a ban on the use of exosomes and stem cells unless you're in an FDA approved study. Really? I know yeah. a ton of people who are getting them all the time. They're probably not getting them here in the U.S. because you have to go. And I was just doing a podcast yesterday where the podcast host was going uh, to another country to get stem cells, uh, stem cell therapy. Are yeah. you sure about 
this? It, unless they're doing an FDA approved study, yes. I that's... know a bunch of people. I mean, I, like I know doctors in Utah whose whole all their, their whole and in Beverly Hills. I you mean... can't technically either that. I mean, if you want to get your office rated, and I have a doctor friend of mine who's an alternative medicine doctor who used to do all the stem cell stuff, and it's gone now. Like uh, this person got. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So right now, as of my knowledge, is that exosomes and stem cells, you can be in a study, and usually these are associated with universities. Um, but other than that, you can't just open up a practice and be like, hey, I'm going to do stem cells like that. You would not just you would that. Get you haven't heard of like all these doctors who are maybe they're not simply doing that, but all these like tele like med spas and longevity doctors, there are biohacking like, well, doctors. And you can do things like IV infusions, uh, peptides and proteins and things like that, but you cannot technically do stem cells and exosomes in the United States anymore. It was allowed for a while. When did they stop it then? Maybe that- It was a few years ago. Oh, that is so, oh my God. Yeah. That, well, that's interesting. Well, thank you for telling me. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, there may be some people still doing it, but they're probably affiliated with some university and and like that but the kind of the wide scale like you know seeing ads like oh you've got knee problems come on over we'll do stem cells you don't see those anymore or at least i know in my area you don't i don't and that's my understanding is it's not legal so my husband broke his neck and his back oh yeah geez. like uh maybe five months ago four and a half months ago going to, i know look at your face i know oh, it's crazy yeah. right no no he's thank god he's uh he's almost like back to normal oh insane. good but but what I'm why I was bringing that up I was I, I wasn't trying to get sympathy from you I was trying <laughs> to tell you that um, his attitude's been great he's like t honestly like he hasn't missed a beat it's like oh, you, you, it's beyond he was working while they're in the, when he found out like he broke his neck but anyway um, my why I'm saying this is because I thought like oh if he got stem cells it would speed up the recovery he never got them yeah. but you know some doctors were like a hundred percent you should be getting them and other other so it could be like, that no way. you may be able to get it. Like I said, if that surgeon or doctor is involved. No, the surgeon or study. doctor doesn't think it's like a, these things are not even properly. Or you would have to go overseas to have it done. In general, that's my understanding. And I may be wrong. Maybe there's some other oh, like no, intricacies no of the laws. Yeah. Like, I didn't look into it for him. I need to say too, one thing I didn't tell you is we uh, spots. IPL is the other thing to do for spots. Uh, intense pulse light. Yes, I heard that. Okay. so I, I knew, That's I, good bang for your buck. But. This is also what I heard. Talk about like shifting gears here, right? About that, we're talking about age spots now, guys. Uh, I heard that you should not be getting IPL if you're out in the sun, because if you are, it'll come right back and it'll get more. Well, the problem with spots is yes, if you keep getting sun, you're going to keep getting spots. So, but what do you do? Do you just leave them and then just keep them? Because they won't go away unless you get rid of them. So it's, it's kind of like, I don't know. I mean, I guess it's like if you have a bad diet, but you exercise, you're like, well, you have a bad diet, so why bother? You're just going to gain weight. Like, yeah. I mean, no, yeah. like <laughs> that you've got to fight. Let's, let's fight this aging process, you know, and, and enjoy it, but not necessarily beat ourselves up, you know, if we're not where we want to be, essentially. Okay. So you're basically telling me I should be getting IPL. So I'm thinking, so process. when I mentioned inside outside approach, I, I talked about the inside, which are the creams. And then the outside is the IPL. Good bang for your buck. If I would give you two really good bang for your bucks for overall anti-aging red light therapy, IPL, and then microneedling would technically be the third one. Okay. So that's good. That's a great sound bite right there. So now we have the three right there together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What are the three top tips to look, is that, would, would you say this is it then? The three top tips to look 10 years younger. So if you want to look, I mean, I always start off, for me, I start out with diet and food and things like that. Because when you're looking at anti-aging overall, the key is going to be starting with the basis. It's like building a house and like these invasive procedures, like the spire on top of the house and the foundation of the house is the food that you eat. Mm -hmm. So if I were to tell you, you know, the number one thing to overall improve your skin, I would say reduce the amount of sugar you eat because that really is inflammatory to your body. It's inflammatory to your skin and it will show in your skin. Now, reduce the amount of sugar is going to make wrinkles go away. No, it's not going to make wrinkles go away. But once again, it's kind of that basis that you have to do because it's constantly attacking the collagen of your skin if you're having too much sugar. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're looking at, okay, I truly want to look 10 years younger, what should I do in like a short span of time? Then yes, I would combine IPL treatments for a lot of people, probably with Morpheus 8. Um, and then if I had one other thing that I would combine that with, probably more for a long term, I would say add a retinol or a bakuchiol to that just to kind of keep those results. Okay. So how about supplementation? Um, mm -hmm. And 
what would you say, what's your belief on supplements? What do you think work? Tell me what you would do. So, yeah, I mean, traditional medicine is not fond of supplements. Um, I was not taught anything about supplementation in my residency. And it really didn't come to, it came down to a point when I had kind of this kind of come to Jesus moment of like, oh my gosh, like what have I, what was I taught? And I, there's, I realized in my career that there is so much that I don't know that I didn't know. Right. Okay. Cause there's a lot of doctors out there and, and the big, one of them, the big one is collagen. So like I will post about collagen uh, uh, supplements and people will comment, my family doctor says it doesn't work. Well, I mean, the big question then is your family doctor may say it doesn't work, but do they know what they don't know? And the answer is probably not. You know, when I had patients come to see me early in my practice and they're on a bunch of supplements, they would ask me, doctor, you know, I'm going to have surgery soon. What should I do with my supplements? And I'd say, oh, just go off all of them because I didn't know anything about them. Right. And I had never taken the time to learn it. And my mentors all in plastic surgery, would, that's what they would say. So then I would basically mimic them. And when I realized that, oh my gosh, there's so much I don't know, I really started studying this. And I spent, I mean, probably thousands of hours comparing the studies that were in our uh, surgical literature on patients who were, let's say, trauma patients who had uh, pressure sores, uh, burn patients, um, people with chronic wounds and how they gave them uh, different nutrition, uh, arginine, glutamine, amino acids, and all that to help with the wound healing. And I com combined that with the teachings of alternative health experts, gut health experts, nutritionists. And I created at that time a surgical supplement protocol that I put my patients on both before and after surgery. Mm -hmm. And I found that the patients did great with it, that not only did I find that my complication rate reduced, but I also found patients coming back and saying, what did you put me on? Because my hair's getting thicker, or geez, my joints feel a lot better, you know, or my bowels are moving much more regularly. I mean, so many of these stories. Now, I never marketed this uh, surgical supplement system because I was afraid that somebody, a different, a patient from a different doctor would take it they would get, let's say, a hematoma, a bleeding complication after surgery, and now I'm their easy scapegoat. Oh, you got that bleeding complication because of his darn supplements, even though they're, I test them to be fine. So right. I never put them out there. But now there are companies who are creating their own pre- and post-surgical supplement systems, and they're almost exactly the same stuff that I had in mind, even though I never actually put it out there. The, the fact is, is that they're doing their own research and they're coming up with the same conclusions, which makes me feel good. Wow. So I do believe in supplements. The big one that people talk about is collagen. And so big question is, do collagen supplements work? Uh, and the answer is yes. And if a doctor tells you they don't work, they just have not looked at the literature. There are so many studies that show that taking a hydrolyzed collagen peptide supplement can improve your skin, can improve your nails, no studies I know of that'll say it improves your, your hair, but it does make sense that it should. Uh, there was a meta-analysis in 2021, over 1,100 people, they took hydrolyzed collagen peptides for 90 days and found a statistically significant improvement in the hydration, in wrinkles, skin hydration, wrinkles, and elasticity of their skin. And there have been prospective placebo-controlled randomized trials where they would put somebody on collagen supplementation for a couple of months and then actually biopsy their skin later and find an increased amount of collagen in their skin. So it works. But the key is you got to get the right collagen supplement and right. you want to get hydrolyzed collagen peptides. Because the argument that people will make who are naysayers will say, oh, the collagen is a large protein and your body is just going to break it down. How do you know it's going to get to your skin? Well, and how do you even know it's going to actually get absorbed? Well, that's why these companies will make hydrolyzed collagen peptides because you take that large protein and you break it down into its individual amino acids or peptides, which are a combination of a small number of amino acids, mm -hmm. making it much smaller so that you can actually absorb it. And that's where you want to look for is hydrolyzed collagen peptides. That's how you know it's good. What's a brand that I should try? So, I mean, I have my own. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, isn't, isn't that convenient? I, you know? I mean, yeah. So, I mean, I have how my own, but there, are, you, yeah. but there are other ones out there that I think are very, very good. You could try the vital proteins. Bulletproof is big with collagen. Um, I would just encourage you, like with anything, try it for a couple did months. Did you bring me some? I did not oh. because I can't get that through uh, security. Uh, TSA, well, you get it. Collagen 
Uh, yeah, oh, you got that. a big tub of, uh, of powder, white powder. Well, that was a, actually, that's why you said that. I was going to ask you, like, what about in the supplement form? Is it okay to take it in a pill form or you just take it as like the scoops? So the pill, scoops? the problem with the pills is that they're capsules that have the powder inside of them. Yeah. And it's much easier to just take the scoop, put it in a hot drink. And typically it should be uh, in general flavorless. Or you can mix it into a smoothie. Yeah, or... but I'm, so you think, because I know a lot of people do this. I think you talked about this too, like putting it in your coffee. Yeah. Um, and it, you can't taste it? Uh, you can't. In, uh, a, lot of, a lot of them you can, some of them you can't. Like that's one of our things is that you can't taste it. I put it in my coffee. Now, I, I put in my coffee for many years. And the last time I went to my dentist, she's like, are you drinking a lot of coffee? And I'm like, uh, yeah. She goes, you got to stop that because your teeth are getting stained. So I'm like, oh. So oh, now really? I just mix in hot water and I can barely taste it. What about, can you put in cold, like anything? Oh, I guess you can. You it's, can smoothie, but. it's like putting like hot chocolate mix into a cup of cold water. It's not going to mix that It well. doesn't work, right? Not, that, not as well, no. See, so you're a, big, you're a big collagen person then. Yeah, I do believe yeah. it works. And like I said, I've looked at the studies and the studies are all very positive on collagen. And okay. And you think fish oil is good too? Yeah. So I'm a fan of fish oil, collagen. Um, in my book, I do recommend certain basic supplements. You know, I think it's good to take a multivitamin every day just because there's so much nutritional deficiencies. Um, I think it's good to take a probiotic every day Let because guess, you have all of these on your lot in your line. Um, we don't sell a probiotic. Oh. Um, we don't sell. I know. So I don't have everything. You know, supplements are a very minor part of what we do for us. It's I know. I'm skincare. just teasing you. Yeah, I'm just teasing. You. <laughs> um, but definitely a da daily probiotic because uh, you know, as you know, I mean, our diet is completely sterile now. You yep. don't have the fermented foods in so many other countries. Yeah. Um, so I do recommend that as well. Okay, so that's not a crazy list. No, and then usually I do recommend some type of like antioxidant mix, uh, okay. just because we don't in general get enough antioxidants in our food. Okay, now what do you believe? What do you think for, in terms of like intermittent fasting, uh, for that type of people say that like the inter people, a lot of people say that fasting has been really good for the aging process, mm -hmm. for longevity, for like autophagy. What is your take on all of that? So I think that's huge. And that's a big part of my book as well. You know, so when you look at um, autojuvenation- you up there, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> when you look at autojuvenation, it's five things I think are the keys to turning back the clock naturally. What you eat, when you eat, nutritional supplements, skincare, and non-invasive treatments. And so we've kind of touched on all of them, but the when you eat. Um, and so exactly, the, the thing that happens basically is the fact that we're alive, our body creates waste products. And our cells can have waste products in the cells. They're basically used uh, in our organelles and proteins and even kind of discarded mitochondria. And so our cells can fill up with this intracellular waste, essentially. And that's one of the main causes of aging of our skin. Mm -hmm. So the way that we get rid of this intracellular waste is a, product that you, is a process that you mentioned called autophagy. Mm -hmm. Autophagy means self-eating, or basically it's a intracellular recycling process where your body, your cells will actually clean out and use that intracellular waste for energy. By doing that, it then cleans itself out of this intracellular waste and it functions more efficiently afterwards, essentially being younger. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the ideas of fasting as a way to increase longevity because your cells will actually uh, act younger because of this process of autophagy. But for autophagy to work, you have to stop eating for a period of time. That's how your body runs out of energy and then it starts using up this, uh, this uh, um, autophagy process to get rid of these intracellular organelles using that as energy. And so in general, you wanna look at stopping eating for at least 12 hours for that process to work. And in our society, as you have talked about in the podcast before, like we're all just used to eating all the time. And so taking time off of eating is the, uh, is the key to do that. And so what I did in the book, is that we have a 21 day jump start where we started people kind of cleaning up their diet. We started them on supplements and skincare products. And then we had them uh, in weeks two and three, we had them start intermittent fasting just two days a week. Okay. Cause you, you want to make sure that they uh, get enough protein because protein, especially as you get older is super, super important. Mm -hmm. um, we started intermittent fasting weeks two and three, just two days a week. And we added one final thing to it. We do know that there are certain foods that can promote the autophagy process even while you're eating, okay? So when they would intermittent fast, they would stop eating at 8 p.m. all the way up until noon the next day. And then when they would break their fast at noon the next day, we would keep them on a, a diet that promoted autophagy. And that is healthy fats. So it would be omega-3 fatty acid-rich foods like cold water fish and monounsaturated fatty acids like olives, avocados, nuts, and seeds. 
and foods that are rich in polyphenols, which, it, which, which essentially are bright or dark colored fruits and vegetables. And so the idea then is even though you break your fast and you're eating, you're eating foods that will still promote the autophagy process, that intracellular renewal. And after this 21 day essentially jumpstart, we had people getting just great results in the quality of their skin. And people would say, yeah, they'd be out to dinner with their friends and their friends were like, wow, your skin looks great. What are you doing? Not knowing that they were doing this jumpstart. Mm -hmm. We even had people who would get stopped by people on the street and say, hey, I just wanna ask you, like, what do you do for your skin? Because your skin looks so nice, like crazy. Well, now it's not a facelift. Yeah. Okay. It's not, a <laughs> it's not a facelift, but it's just seeing that quality of your skin, and then people lost a few unwanted pounds, and they just they felt better, and their skin improved, and yeah, it was pretty amazing. What do you think about genetics, though? How much of this of all of this? Twenty percent. You think genetics is only twenty percent? Yep. Yeah, that's what studies show. With they when you're looking that. at aging, it's twenty eighty. Yep, eighty percent. It's this whole idea of epigenetics where genes will determine 20% of your appearance, of your health, and the other 80% are how your genes are expressed based off of your lifestyle choices. And I truly believe that your body, and this is the whole concept of autojuvenation, that your body has regenerative abilities. You just need to give it the, ascent, the tools and, and the environment in order to do that, you know, I mean, and you see people who have these horrible injuries, you know, I, I see that myself and my patients where we cut them open and we cut all the skin off of them and stuff and how quickly they heal. You know, I can do a, a, a tummy tuck on somebody where I literally remove pounds of skin from their tummy. I lift their tummy off of the muscles of, uh, of their abdomen, pull everything down. I suture it together. And within two weeks, they're driving a car, running errands, like doing anything but exercising. Like, our bodies want to be healthy. Our bodies want to heal itself. We just need to give it the right tools and the environment to do that. You're saying you can exercise after a tummy tuck after two weeks? Three weeks. You can exercise after three. I say Seriously? they want to exercise, oh, okay, okay, okay. but they start at three weeks. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. You don't work the abs though for much longer than that. But yeah, people, we get people on light exercise at three weeks. That's pretty common. Is it? Oh yeah. And why, and so is this why you look so young? You look like you're like literally 12 years old. Yeah, you know, I How go on. Are you? Uh, so I put on social media that I'm like, I'm 88 years old, and they're like, "Wow, you're 88. You look like you're 40." <laughs> or they all put like, "Oh, people are like, how old are you?" And I'll put, "I'm 25." They go, "Oh, dang, you should start using your own skincare." <laughs> uh, so I'm 51, and um, you look freaking good. Thank you. But I've had a ton of work done. No, I'm no, kidding. have you? No, no, I'm okay, kidding. okay. I'm like, I had my jaw <laughs> broken and reset between high school and college because it used to stick out real far. And I've had, I get Botox between my brows and then I do skincare. I get Morpheus under my chin. I've had IPL. I have people though, you know, what's so funny. I get people that comment on my posts, like he's had so much work done. His face is frozen and it's all puffy. And I'm like, I don't think I look that bad. No, you know, I had one person <laughs> commented. He looks like a 60 year old Thai woman who's had way too much work done. Are you joking? <laughs> yeah. People are so nasty, aren't they? It's yeah. The you know what I do? on there. But like you know nasty. what I do though, as I have high school um, kids. Sorry about that. That's, That's crazy. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have kids who are in high school and you know, I don't put them on my social media on purpose because I know that like literally one comment of you're ugly or you're stupid or something like that could, I mean, be so hurtful. Yeah. So what I do now is I show them all these insults of dad. <laughs> oh, look at, what this, look at what this person said about dad. And I laugh about it because it doesn't hurt me anymore. Like yeah. I, I'm fine with it. And, and my hope is that someday when they're feeling bad about themselves or somebody says something mean to them, yeah. they'll look back and go, oh, you know, that one person said that dad looked like a 60-year-old Thai woman who's had way too much plastic surgery and he laughed it off. Exactly. Like, okay, you know, I, maybe I can do that too. Well, I think that's, that's, that's great. And also the fact that like you shouldn't be getting your all your self-esteem and self-confidence from aesthetic, like how you look. I mean, yeah. that's And the problem is a lot of people think that if they get all this work done, it's going to make them... Uh, more confident. And a lot of times it's really, the, it, I mean, you're a doctor, you're the, you're the doctor, not me, but what would you say to that? Do you find that like people's mental health, mental health and happiness really does improve from surgery? I mean, you can, it can, but you can never, if all you do is compare yourself to somebody else, there's yeah. always going to be somebody who's better looking. There's somebody who's smarter, somebody who's more successful, who has more money. I mean, you just can't do that. You know, and I think in life, the way I look at it, overall and as aging is it's like, you know, I'm 51 and I look in the mirror and I don't look like I used to. I got puffiness under my eyes and stuff like that that I didn't have before. But at the same time, I also think, what's the alternative? Like, I don't know, I have friends, I have a friend of mine from high school who died a few months ago. And it's like, 
dang, you know, I mean, that's, this is happening. It totally and is. so for me, the way I look at it and the way I try to encourage my patients who sometimes look in the mirror and they feel bad about themselves is look, you know, it is a blessing to get older. Now, the fact is, is that we're in a day and age where we have so many options to turn back the clock and, and look younger from food, you know, from fasting, supplements, skincare, non-invasive treatments, that this is a great time to be getting older because we have so much at our fingertips that we can do to turn back the clock and look the way we want to look. Right. You know, it's it, fight it every step of the way and enjoy that whole process, you know, because you got one shot here. Yeah, absolutely. You know? So why feel bad about it? But at the same time, why not fight it if you want to? You know, why not zap that wrinkle? Why not, you know, get rid of that line that you don't want to get rid of? You know, you live once and if you have the op you know, opportunity to do that and you're not putting yourself under risk by going under the knife and stuff, why not do that? No, absolutely. So those those kind of things don't bother me at all. It's more, I'm just, I'm a scaredy cat when it comes to going under and getting like, I, I think I said this to you, like, I've never, I hate my nose. I've always hated it. I've been a scaredy cat. I've never touched it because of that. Like, would I like to have a nicer nose, a better nose? Yeah, but I know that realistically, it's not going to change my life. It won't make me happier. It won't, it won't change my my trajectory in any real way. And so I've talked myself out of it yeah. for like 30 years. Well, in the end, I, yeah, with surgery, you've got to look at the risks and the benefits and what's the worst, you know, for me as a surgeon, I always look at what's the worst thing that can happen. And knowing that, is it worth going to surgery? So for you, if you're like, hey, if I go to have my nose job, what's the worst thing that can happen? Well, you can die in the operating room. That's very, very unlikely, but technically that is. More realistic things is you could have scar tissue and not maybe not be happy with your result. You can potentially, if they break your nose in, you may find that you can't breathe as well through one, one nostril. And will that bother you? Um, yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it can change your voice. You know, nose jobs can change your voice. There's a reason why Barbara Streisand never had a nose yes, job. Yes, exactly. Um, so we have studies showing that it can change your voice. And so you really want to put all that in together and say, do I really want to have this done? And if you are not 100% gung-ho of, yes, I want to do it, then the answer is don't because you never regret plastic surgery you don't do. You only regret the stuff you did that you probably shouldn't have. 100%. I have a question that's kind of, uh, you said it earlier and I wanted to, and we can wrap it up. I have no idea how long we've been talking, but a long time. <laughs> uh, the show Botched. Would you ever yes. do a show like that? Because someone like you who has such a big following now has that show. I mean, so, you said you're pitching shows. Would yeah. that be a show? that One of the things I really would like to do, and we are pitching it for uh, different production companies is a, and I'll give away my idea because it's not that, like it's not groundbreaking, but it's a pro bono show. It's mm -hmm. where you have people who would really benefit from surgery, but um, they just can't afford it. And like is Black there a, Swan. Do you remember that show from a long time ago, Black oh, Swan? The Swan. Oh, The Swan. Not Black, Black Swan is oh, the, the Natalie sorry, Portman. Right, yeah, sorry, I'm sorry, say. not that. The Swan, <laughs> The Swan. But the Swan was a bit of a horror show because you take oh. people and, and, you, and really you play games with their emotions. Because really, for that show was one where you they undergo all these procedures and they can't look in a mirror until they're completely healed and they don't know how they and so there's this like horrifying like finale where they finally they raise the veil and you can look in the mirror and and, and see if you're happy with your results and it's just it's I thought it was pr quite exploitative myself. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, I, so, I never watched an episode, but I remember the show. So what? It, yeah. So you have somebody who's really down their luck, feels really bad about themselves, and they undergo a like a ton of plastic surgery, get their teeth done, like all this stuff, make them look like a completely different person. And you put them on a 1200 calorie a day diet and you make them work out every day to try to lose weight. And they get tons of liposuction, which when you think about it, going on a 1200 calorie diet and having major surgery, you're not getting enough protein to heal. No. Like that's not the right situation for healing from surgery. Um, so anyways, they do all this stuff. And then at the end, there's this huge reveal where all the different practitioners are standing in a half circle. The person goes up to the big mirror and they go, voila. And they look in the mirror and they go, oh my gosh, I'm beautiful. Stuff like that. And it's like, you were beautiful before, you know? Uh, and okay. then they they don't get necessarily the psychological help that they need. And, and anyway. I know. So, I mean, that's the whole other thing. But so yeah. what's your show? So my it. idea would be is if we took basically people who uh, maybe can't afford plastic surgery, but there are people who really have help other people all their lives? And is there a way we can um, nominate people, heroes in the community that people may not know about um, who would benefit from something surgical? And uh, and we vote and get them the surgery for free and see their transformation. That's a very simple idea, but it essentially would be helping people who um, have always spent their lives helping other people. And now it's 
it's a little time to help them and you say know, thank you. Fine. I like the idea, the concept, but I think you're in a time right now where everything is about body positivity and like yeah. that, that show would seem not to me, but people would like, people wouldn't want to res- put that show out there because it, you're basically telling people that they need to work on their outside. You know, they're not that, that but, they're not uh, fine yeah. and okay. Or they're not good enough the way they are. I think though, it depends on what operation you're doing. It's different if you're saying, well, I, you know, as a woman, I'm a B cup and I want to be a double D cup. Yeah. Like, okay. That's one versus let's say you have a woman who's had four children has, you know, a single mom who's worked all her life to help her kids get through school and everything. And she's, after having these kids has all the skin hanging from her mm-hmm. tummy. She's got rashes. She can't fit into the pants very well and stuff like that. Can't exercise. That's what I'm thinking. Okay, you know, yeah, somebody like that. Saying. You know, yeah, who, I got you. Yeah. that's the way I would look at it. versus like a guy who, you know, wants a facelift because he wants to pick up girls or pick something. Up chicks. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> probably not the kind of show that will probably get made, right? No, but you know, the ones that they that I and I get offered shows all the time, but it's always kind of exploitative type stuff, and I just turn it all down. And super cheesy, but that show botched has been on for how many yeah. years? Like, yeah. and that's good. Those are really good doctors. I don't know them personally, but they do a really good job, I and mean, they turn people down. People who are not. Candace, they'll say, no, this isn't the right thing for you. You know, rethink it because it's not worth it. I'm, I'm, I'm friends with one of their husbands. I mean, one of the wives, Heather Dubrow's husband is uh, yeah, I, I yeah, think a yeah. botched doctor. Well, he was also a swan doctor way in, back he in the was? day. He was? Yeah, oh yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Like, that's, yeah. they used to say but he doctors. seems like a really good guy. I have no idea. Yeah. I've never met him, actually. Yeah. I, I have. I just seen him on TV and he seems like a straight up guy. Oh, really? Yeah, okay, yeah, that's yeah. good. I like to hear that. That yeah. makes me happy. Okay, so your book. So the book is called Younger for Life. Also, you can find where tell everybody all your things, and then we can, you know, get you out of here. I yeah. Mean, after, so you know, I know it's been like what five hours. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, um, so Younger for Life, you can buy it wherever books are sold. I try to encourage people to go. If you're going to buy online, I try to encourage people to go to bookshop.org. A lot of people don't know this is a website where you can order books online, and you can actually choose your local independent bookstore. And when you buy the book, the profit will go to that independent bookstore. So it's bookstores that don't have this big presence like some of the huge ones do, um, and they can still get the profit from the sale. Now, it's also on Amazon and Costco and all those Barnes & Noble and stuff too. Um, but once, once again, bookshop.org is where we try to point people to if they're open to that. Um, and then we have a website called autojuvenation.com. And on that website, if you do order the book, we have a ton of free gifts, uh, a companion recipe book, a $30 gift certificate to my online store if you want to try any of the skincare products, uh, and a whole lot more as a thank you for getting the book. That's amazing. Thank you so much. This is really fun. I appreciate you coming on. Well, thank you so much for having me on. This, yeah. this is great. Appreciate it. It was awesome. Everyone, go go check out his book. It's, it's great. And his video. It's so good. <laughs> thank you, Jennifer. You're welcome. Uh, bye. Bye.